Welcome to Spiritual Growth. Uh, this is session number five, and we're going to be talking tonight about knowing the Father. And one of the reasons why I'm really excited about this, besides it's just great, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible about it, is that most Christians know a lot about Jesus. If I ask you about, tell me about Jesus. Who, what do you know about Jesus? Well, Jesus was the Son of God. He was God in the flesh, and he walked on the earth. And uh, he, uh, these, I don't know what we've done with the lights recently, but these lights are a lot brighter than they usually are, and it's kind of hard for me to see and concentrate. So if we could fix those, that would be great. Thank you. Um, the, um, but with um, Jesus, uh, he, he walked the earth, the Son of God, God in the flesh. He showed us how to live on the earth. Then he died on the cross, uh, rose again on the third day, sent it into heaven, and sent the Holy Spirit. How many of you pretty much knew most of what I just said, if not all? Right. So then if I ask people, who's the Holy Spirit? Oh, well, the Holy Spirit is the presence of God that Jesus sent to the earth on the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit indwells believers. The Holy Spirit is the part of God who is with us, on us, and in us. And the Holy Spirit gives us... Uh, uh, revelation knowledge into the word and the Holy Spirit anoints us and anoints our lives. How many of you pretty much knew what I just said? Already knew most of that, if not all of it. So when you ask people about now, tell me about the Father, God the Father. Most people don't know a lot about, well, he's Jesus' dad. <laughs> so beside, okay, so what else? What does he do? What's your relationship to God the Father? See, we know a lot about Jesus, and we should. We know a lot about the Holy Spirit, and we should. The Holy Spirit is the presence of, of God uh, in our lives. But tonight, we're going to talk about knowing the Father. If you turn with me to the book of 1 John, which is where our, uh, our text for this is, uh, the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 13. And this is where we've been talking about uh, adolescence. Here we, we've, uh, 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 this is mainly what we, we cover on Sunday mornings, not 100%, but most of the time, that's where this gets covered. This is the class that you just took, the, the tracks that you just took on uh, Napios, toddler. And now we're talking about it here. That we didn't list exhaustively everything, <coughs> pardon me, that you're going to learn here, but basically... Uh, paid on means an adolescent, and we've talked about overcoming the devil, and now we're going to talk about knowing the Father. Here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 13, can we close that door, please? Uh, that would be great if, if an usher or somebody could close that door, that would be great. 1 John 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 13, it says, I write to you, thank you, Dan, I write to you, little children, this is the second part. Well, let me, let me read the whole verse. 1 John 2.13. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. That's the Greek word, neoniskos, and it also means an adolescent. There's, there are two Greek words here that are used interchangeably that mean an older child or an adolescent. Neoniskos, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. And that's what we uh, covered in the last two sessions. Then it says, I write to you, little children. That's the uh, Greek word paidon. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. Now here it's not saying you have known Jesus or you have known the Holy Spirit. He is saying here you at its adolescence, you in this stage of spiritual growth, know the Father. So tonight we're, that's what we're going to talk about, knowing the Father. What does it mean to know the Father? Who is the Father? We all know who Jesus is for the most part. We all know who the Holy Spirit is. But wouldn't you like to know who the Father is? Yes. Yes. All right, so who the Father is. Now, before we talk about knowing, well, this is talk, we're going to talk about who the Father is, and then we're going to talk about knowing, actually knowing the Father. In talking about knowing the Father, this Greek word for known, you have, he says, you have known the Father. 
You have known. That word have known in the Greek is a Greek word, genosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O, genosko. And it means to learn. You're not be able to write all of this down, but I'll give you just a basic definition. It means to learn, to acquire information about, to become familiar with through personal experience. It also means, and I'll be as tactful as I can here, it also means sexual intercourse. Uh, for example, in um, Matthew chapter 125, it says Joseph did not know his wife Mary until after Jesus was born. That doesn't mean he didn't know her name. He didn't know, what, he didn't know about her. He didn't know her characteristics. That means that they didn't have intimate relations until after Jesus was born, but they used the same word to know. And so to uh, hear when... Uh, John says, I'm writing to you, uh, children, because you have known the Father. First of all, he's talking about you have learned the Father. You have acquired information about the Father. You have become familiar with the Father through personal experience. And you have been intimate. If we could say it that way, you've been intimate with the Father. Now, why this is important? about knowing, before we even talk about the Father, this idea of knowing is because knowing the Father is not an event. It is an ongoing experience. It's an ongoing experience because sometimes, uh, I, I, I love it when people, I don't love it, but it's interesting how people name drop. Any of you know any name droppers? Which means they can be introduced to someone one time and they know them. They don't know them. They think they know them. Uh, Katy Perry's parents were here not too long ago, and they took us to Katy's concert. And we went backstage and met Katy. Shook her hand, talked to her. Do we know her? No, we don't know her. But there are people who would tell you, oh, I know Katy Perry. And what they should say is, yes, I met her one time, but if you brought my name up to her now, she wouldn't remember who you were talking about because we don't know her. And so knowing the Father is not an event as in, oh, you met him one time, had an experience with, with, you had an experience with Jesus, and so now you know him. Jesus died on the cross for you, you raised your hand, now you know him. Uh, but knowing, there's an intimacy that comes uh, that comes to your life when you know the Father. Knowing the Father involves intimacy, not just a head knowledge. So now when we're talking about knowing the Father, uh, it's important that we get a, a concept in our head of the Trinity. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, 1 John 4, 7, And these three that bear witness in heaven are the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 7. These three bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Well, we know that according to uh, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then in verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. So we know from John, not 1 John, but the book of John, the gospel of John chapter 1, we know that Jesus is the Word. So when the Bible says there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, John chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 4 and 14 tell us, uh, tells us that the Word is Jesus. So the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and these three are one. The Bible teaches uh, a, that God is in three persons. Most people refer to that as the Trinity. But that God is in three persons. There, there are not three gods. There's only one God. But that God is in three persons. Well, how can one God be in three persons? Well, sometimes we try to, with our pea brain, we try to wrap our head around some spiritual things. They're not too big for us. We just have to, we just have to learn to think out of the box and not just think in human terms. God, there is only one God, but he is in three persons, Father, Son, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that these three are one, but they are three separate individuals. They're the Father... Uh, can be one place, the Holy Spirit can be every place, Jesus walking on the earth can be one place and not be another place. Uh, there are three separate distinct uh, persons. Uh, there are several 
scriptures that lend themselves to that. One is in Genesis chapter 1 when the Bible, uh, after creation happens, and then the Bible says, and God said, I believe this is chapter 1, it's along verse 28, 27, 28, 29, somewhere in there. And God said, the one God, how many gods are there? One. And God said, let us make man in our image. So who's he talking to? God said, God, who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. He doesn't have personality issues. There are three persons to God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The three of them are having a conversation. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So this proves that, there, that there's more than one person to God that, uh, that is communicating and that is ruling the universe. And when I describe the Trinity to people, I kind of like to describe it like this. Uh, there, when, you, when you have a car, a car has a, an engine, an interior, and a trunk. And the trunk doesn't do what the engine does, and the engine doesn't do what the interior does, but you stand back and look at it and call it a car. So it's the same way you have God. You have God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit doesn't do what the Father does, and the Father doesn't do what the Son does, but you stand back and look at all three of them and call them God. Does this help anybody? So now, um, when we're talking about the Father, you know, we're pretty much familiar with what the Son does or has done and is continuing to do. And we teach a lot about that in the church and teach a lot about the Holy Spirit and what He does. So now let's talk for a few minutes about who the Father actually is. Um, one of the reasons why that we know so much about Jesus the Son is because of the book of John chapter 3 verse 35. In John 3 35, Jesus makes this statement, the Father has given all things into my hand. So that means Jesus is walking the earth and the Holy Spirit, Jesus is, is I, don't, I don't want to say this in a disrespectful way, but Jesus is moving and shaking across the earth and he's doing all this stuff and then Jesus is actually speaking and things are happening in another town and in another county and then the Holy, he sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit under the direction of Jesus has come to earth and Jesus is doing all this, uh, the Holy Spirit is doing all of this stuff and Jesus is making intercession for us and so it's real easy to major on Jesus and on the Holy Spirit, and not give a lot of thought to the Father. Uh, that doesn't mean you're a bad Christian if you haven't thought about this before, because Jesus did say, the Father has given all things into my hand. So, so much of what's happening is because of what Jesus has done or is doing, and what the Holy Spirit has done or is doing. So who is the Father? First of all, in John chapter 10, I'm going to try to go uh, quickly enough that we can get through this, but slowly enough that, the, that you can write some of this down. John chapter 10, verse 15 says, no one knows the Father except Jesus who reveals him to them. So when, uh, here in the book of 1 John, when he is saying, uh, I'm writing to you, little children, because you have known the Father. The only way we're going to know the Father is that Jesus reveals or has revealed the Father to us. Then second of all, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, and I, and I want you to start to, to realize, I want the light to come on tonight, and I want you to start thinking about, wow, there's a lot in the Bible about the Father. Because we, we know a lot about Jesus, we know a lot about the Holy Spirit, but most people, when I teach this, go, wow, I didn't realize that all this stuff was in the Bible about God the Father that doesn't apply to the Son or the Holy Spirit. Here's another one. Matthew 24, 36 says that only the Father knows when the return of Jesus will occur. Don't you get a big kick out of all the guys that are writing books and all the guys on television, everybody saying that they can pretty much predict when Jesus is coming? Jesus doesn't even know. According to the Bible, Jesus doesn't know when he's coming. Only Jesus said, I don't know. Only the Father knows when I will return. Here's another one. John chapter 8, verse 28 says that Jesus only did what his father told him to do. And then in John 12, 49, Jesus did not speak on his own authority, but he said what his father told him to say. So Jesus 
Um, it, it's interesting how when Jesus was on the earth, and how many of you remember the centurion when Jesus was on the earth, and the centurion came to him and said, my servant is sick. And Jesus said, well, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion said, well, you don't have to do that. If you just speak the word, I'm a man under authority, and I understand how authority works. So you don't even have to come. When you speak, it'll happen. And it was in a completely different place. And Jesus turned and marveled at the people. And he said, I haven't seen this much faith in all of Israel because this centurion understood how authority works. Well, not only did the, the, one of the reasons why this connected with Jesus is because Jesus does the same thing. Jesus didn't do or say anything on his own. He says, I only did. He didn't just say, well, I listened to the Father, and if he's got a good idea, I'll probably put that into practice. Jesus said, I only do what my Father tells me to do. John chapter, or was that 12, I think. Uh, John chapter 8, 28. I only do what my Father tells me to do. If my Father doesn't tell me to do it, I don't do anything. And then John chapter 12, I, own, I don't speak on my own authority, but I only say what the Father tells me to say. So when Jesus is on the earth and you're watching Jesus operate in power and authority and you see all this stuff happening, there is a power behind the scenes, which is his Father who is directing his earthly ministry. Did you ever think about this? Isn't this interesting? Um, then here's another one. John chapter 14, verse 16. This is, I found this fascinating. Jesus prayed, in John 14, 16, it says, Jesus prayed and he asked the Father, and the Father sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Jesus prayed and he asked the Father, Father, would you please send the, he, he, he came down here apparently, he saw our condition and he realized, man, if I, if I ascend into heaven, these guys aren't going to make it. They're not going to be able to do this. Father, we need to send the Holy Spirit. Would you please send the Holy Spirit? And then Acts chapter 1 verse 7 says, As a result, the Father gave the Holy Spirit to Jesus, who then in turn gave the Holy Spirit to the church. This all originated with the Father. And Jesus even had to ask his Father permission or ask his Father for the Holy Spirit to be able to send to the church. Here's another one. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Jesus was not raised from the dead by his own power, by his own innate power. Jesus didn't, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, but it was the glory, the power of the glory of the Father that raised Jesus from the dead. You see how the Father, God the Father is involved in everything? And, and a lot of times we don't think about this. Another one, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. I like this. In the end, 1 Corinthians 15, 25 tells us that at the end of the age, that Jesus is going to present the kingdom that he has built to his father. So this is one of the reasons why that it's so important that we be about the, the work of building the kingdom and we allow Jesus to build the kingdom of God in us, in our hearts, in our lives, in our, to build his church. This is why the Bible says that uh, upon the rock of Peter's confession that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that God, that Jesus will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Because at the end of the age then, Jesus is going to bring this church that he has built and he's going to present it to his father. One time years ago, uh, you're, you're going to find this funny, I'm sure. I made a purse for Connie. I went to a craft store and I bought, I went to a craft store. I didn't know what I was doing. They had to tell me how to do it. I didn't know how to do it, but I wanted to, you know, it was back. This was, this was 25 years ago when all the rage was women had these wooden purses with decals on them. And I went to a craft store and I bought a, a raw wooden box and I bought the shellac that goes on it. I bought the latches. I bought the handle. I bought the decals. And I worked on this thing. And I worked on this thing because I was going to present it to her as a birthday gift. I messed up one of the decals. And I had to go buy And rather than just, well, no big deal. I tried. I scraped it off, sanded it off, and then went and bought another one and put it on there because I wanted it to be perfect. Because I wanted to present that to her for her birthday. 
And Jesus is perfecting his church. Why is Jesus, what is the deal? Why is Jesus always messing with our stuff and messing in our lives and, you know, trying to, trying to get everybody together and trying to get people to walk in unity and trying to get people to do what they're supposed to do? And why is the Holy Spirit rebuking us, and convicting us and dealing with us? What is, why, why can't he just save us and leave us alone and one day we can go to heaven? Because the Bible says that Jesus is going to present the church as a gift to his father that he built. And so he wants it to be right. Amen. 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 Okay. So now, so these are some of the things that the, and this is a fascinating study, but these are some of the basic things that the Bible says about God, the father. So now let's spend the rest of our time talking about how do we know the Father. This says we we know Jesus. We know who Jesus is. We know the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's with us and on us and in us. Everybody say thank God God. for the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Okay, so we got we we understand who Jesus is and He's seated at the right hand of the Father. We know who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit's in this room right now. He is the presence of God on the earth right now. So how do we know the Father? Let's look at that. Here's what the Bible says. First of all, number one, John 6, tells us that no one, John 6, tells us that no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. So we're thankful for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our church services. But remember, the Father gave the Holy Spirit to Jesus, who then in turn gave the Holy Spirit to the church. And the Bible says, Jesus said in John 6, that nobody comes to Jesus unless the Father draws him. I pray this a lot for people. There, anybody in here know somebody who needs Jesus? And sometimes, have you ever felt like you just talk to, talk to somebody till you're just blue in the face and they won't listen? You know, they need Jesus. They really need Jesus. And so you talk and you try to convince them and you try to, you do this and you do that. But somewhere along the line, once you get to the end of yourself, you've got to realize nobody comes to the Father, uh, comes to Jesus unless the Father draws him. And the Father uses the Holy Spirit to draw people. So at, at, Many points in my life and in my ministry and even my personal life, I've had to just stop and say, okay, I can't do this anymore. This person is not going to give their life to Christ no matter how. I can talk till I pass out. It's not going to happen until the Father draws them. And so then you pray to the Father and ask him to draw them. Uh, Number two, how to know the Father. Number two, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, That through Jesus' atonement and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we have access to the Father. And this is important. I want you to write this down because we're going to move quickly to the next one. This is why you need to know this. Ephesians 2.8, through Jesus' atonement and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we have access to the Father. Thirdly, and this may be the most important thing that I say all night. Thirdly, John chapter 16, verse 26, Jesus told his disciples, in that day, you will pray to my father and he will answer you. Jesus, in in context there, what Jesus said to his disciples is, up until now, you have been asking me for things and whatever you ask me for in faith, I gave you. But But that day will come when I will no longer be with you and you will ask the father in my name and he will answer your prayers. This is so vitally important because, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to fault any, anybody. We're not, no condemnation, but it's rampant in the body of Christ that people are praying to Jesus. How many times have we heard people start their prayers by saying, dear Jesus, Jesus, would you do this? Jesus Jesus said, in that day, once I'm gone, you won't be asking me anymore. You will ask the Father in my name. This, just getting a revelation and understanding of this one thing will revolutionize your life. Jesus died on the cross for us and redeemed us from the curse and redeemed us from our sin nature so that we could be the righteousness of God in Christ. 
Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit to be with us, on us, and in us. And the presence, sensing the presence of the Holy Spirit is, is a very real thing, a very real sensation. But when it comes to praying and getting answers to our prayers, you've got to realize that the Father is the top, is the, uh, the, the that God the Father is the boss uh, of this whole thing. And so we're asking the the whole, sometimes we pray and we ask Jesus stuff. And Jesus said, well, you don't, when I was on the earth, why are you asking me? Because when I was on the earth, I only did what the Father told me to do. I only said what the Father told me to say. I can only give you what the Father tells me that I can give you. And so when I go, then in my name, you can ask the Father yourself. This will revolutionize your prayer life. Now, just personally, in my own personal prayer life, I talk to the Holy Spirit. I talk, he's, he is so real. Any of you ever experienced that? He's so real in my life and in my prayer time. I talk to him. I ask him questions. I have conversations with the Holy Spirit. If you ever come in uh, in the sanctuary, come in my prayer closet and you hear me pray, it sounds like I'm talking to myself. That I have personality issues. But I know I talk to the Holy Spirit all the time, asking questions. And, but when it comes to praying and petitioning for things, I need this. I need for this to happen in Connie's life. I, God, I need for you to do this in my children's life. Father, we need this for the church. I'm asking the Father. So when we get real wrapped up in asking Jesus for things, Jesus, would you do this? Jesus, would you do that? Jesus is saying, well, I, I've already done everything I'm going to do for you. I died on the cross, shed my blood for your sins, for your sin nature, redeemed you for the, from the curse, and now I am seated at the right hand of the Father. I am make, making intercession for you. But what I told you as my disciples was that once I said to the Father, then you can ask the Father yourself in my name. So this, should, this will revolutionize your prayer life. When you realize that, uh, that, you know, I've been asking Jesus. I've been asking the Holy Spirit for stuff. I've been asking Jesus for stuff. And Jesus said that's not how he told us to pray. So this is why Ephesians 2.8, that was number two. Ephesians 2.8 says, through Jesus' atonement and the presence of the Holy Spirit, you have access to the Father. Which is mind-boggling to me. To think, think with me for just a minute. Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. He created the whole, not just everything you see, not just the world, but the universe and the galaxies and the stars. There, there are scientists that, that say there are millions of galaxies that are just as big as ours out there somewhere. I'm not a scientist. I don't understand. I don't know what's accurate. I don't understand all that. It's just mind-boggling just to look at the universe through a telescope and realize, wow, there's a lot of stuff out there. Jesus Christ created all of that with his spoken word. Isn't that amazing? And then Jesus tells us, you can have direct access to my dad. So how big is the father? If Jesus does all that, than just to, just to try to, to comprehend his father, to me, is, I mean, that, that's something that, that if I tried to think about that while I went to sleep, it would, I wouldn't be able to sleep. You, are y'all getting this? The bigness of, the, of this? So Jesus says, uh, you think I'm big. I'm going to give you access in my name. In the name of Jesus, we have access to his father. We can go directly to his father and ask him. So this kind of puts a completely different perspective on getting answers to our prayers. I think that the God, uh, that the father of the God that created the whole universe with his spoken word is big enough to answer all my little bitty prayers. That seem to be such big prayers. You ever have prayers that you just, that are just looming? It's like, oh God, you've got to do something. My world is crumbling. Do you realize how big God is? God the Father 
No, we don't realize how big God the Father is. We can't even comprehend Jesus, the Son who walked the earth, speaking the worlds and the universe into existence. And then his Father, I can't even count, comprehend that. All I know is it's, he's probably big enough to handle anything I've got. So I probably need one of those bumper stickers that says, God is big enough to handle any problem I have. I like that. You like that? Yeah. So... John 14, 21 through 23 tells us this. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now there is another scripture, and forgive me for not finding it tonight. There is another scripture that talks about worshiping Jesus. So worshiping Jesus is perfectly... Uh, perfectly acceptable. It is something that we do, something we do here at the church. We worship Jesus. You'll hear the worship team leading us in worship to Jesus. But also the Bible says that we will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The, the one part of God, the one part of the Trinity that the Bible never says that we're to worship is the Holy Spirit. The Bible never says to worship the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's here to help us worship Jesus and to worship the Father. He's not here to be worshiped himself even though he is God. Then Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says that it's the Father who gives us wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. It's the Father that gives us wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. And then the last one I want to cover, and there's a lot in the Bible about this. I want, I want you to become conscious as you're reading the Bible, all the places where the Bible says the Father, where Jesus says, my Father, where the Bible talks about God the Father. Uh, most of Paul's letters begin by saying, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. From God the Father and the Lord. And most people just gloss over, oh, you never even thought about that before, but you go back and you read Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and, and all these books that Paul wrote, and almost every one of them begins by saying, grace and peace to you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's, a, it's amazing when you start seeing all through the New Testament, God the Father. God, keep it in mind that Jesus the Son is the God of the Old Testament. So anytime you, you don't see God the Father referred to in the Old Testament, I have never, it's a big book so i got to be careful that I say it's never in there. Uh, but I, as much reading as I've done, as much studying as I've done, I have never seen God the Father. I used to think it was God the Father until I got a revelation of John chapter 1 that said, in the beginning was the Word, it was, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without the Word, nothing was made. And then verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and bam, all of a sudden, Oh, so the God of old, the Old Testament is Jesus. The God in the burning bush with Moses was Jesus. The God who spoke the worlds into existence was Jesus. And so with that mindset, going back and reading the Old Testament, I've never found God the Father in the Old Testament. I'm not saying he's not in there. He probably is somewhere, but it's Jesus all the way. But then you get to the New Testament, and Jesus, the God of the Old Testament, shows up and walks the earth, and he says, if you think I'm big, Let me introduce you to my father. The last thing about God the Father is Ephesians 5.20 that says we are to give thanks to the Father in all things. We're to give thanks to the Father in all, all things. I'm sure it's not, uh, it's not incorrect to thank Jesus. How many of you have ever said thank you, Jesus? I, I said it a lot of times, you know, thank you, Jesus. And we should, we should thank Jesus. But how many times, the Bible says that we should thank the Father in all things. So what, when was the last time you said, thank you, Father? Understanding that he's a completely different person than Jesus. It's all, he's all God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one God. So I don't, I don't think that, I don't necessarily think, or not necessarily, I don't think at all that God, the Father gets jealous because we worship his son Jesus too much. Or that we said, thank you, Jesus, and God the Father is going, uh, what about me? I did that. <laughs> Not going to pay any attention to me. I, I, God's, God is obviously so much bigger than that. But I think for, for us, we need to be conscious of the bigness of God when a person gets a revelation. See, wh what this really does, what I've taught you tonight, I hope, 
what it does for me anyway, just studying it again and reviewing it again, what it does for me is it gives me a revelation of the bigness of God and it makes my problems look really small. The problems that kept you awake last night. When you get up and you start meditating on what Jesus said about his father. See, Jesus, when I look at the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and what Jesus was able to do, I just personally feel like that Jesus has the ability to handle any problem that I have. But Jesus said that it, that wasn't enough for him. He wanted us to be connected with his father. So how many of you tonight would say that maybe any problems, any issues, any frustrations, any difficulties, any situations that you're dealing with right now maybe look a little bit smaller now in the light of how big God is? The Father God that Jesus said, now you have access to the Father in my name. You used to ask me for stuff. Now you don't. And Jesus is big enough to do pretty much anything we need. But now you don't even have to ask me. You can ask the Father. So praise God for the Holy Spirit and Jesus the Son. But let's be conscious of the present day ministry of God the Father, who he is, what he has done, what he is doing, and the access that we have and the access he has to our lives. Amen? Amen? Amen. Good.